one, it feels good to be back and say, welcome back to my channel. It's been a long time since I filmed a video and I'm so happy to announce that I have a new video series. It's called Call Center to Freelancer. So over the years, I have filmed so many videos about call centers and the BPO industry, but now I want to evolve and make more videos about the journey that I've had since working in a call center years ago. So I hope you follow me in this new journey. And if you find this helpful, please go ahead and share. Um, ask me questions in the comment section after this video and I'll really appreciate it. So the first part of this video is to bring you down the memory lane. It's a brief rundown of my career from being a call center agent to being a freelancer. The reason being is that I want to really take you from the beginning, how I started, and take you to this point in my life where I feel that I've really evolved and I really improved and hopefully you can get some insights along the way as well. The second part of this video is going to be uh, the differences between an employee and a freelancer. There are so many pros and cons, but I'm going to touch just the basics and the general ones in this video. And the last part is my earnings from when I was still starting as a BPO employee compared to now that I'm a freelancer. And just to let you know, this is not a flex of like what I have already earned, but this is just to give you an idea and to inspire you that there is really an opportunity for you to earn more or to increase your earning potential and improve your life. Like stop living from paycheck to paycheck. So let's begin. Okay, so here's a brief rundown of my journey. I started as a working student. I think that was back in third year college. I became a talent marketer because I wanted to earn additional income. I was a communication arts student. I studied in Davao and then I just found this um, ad or commercial somewhere. Uh, it's a bit shady, but I still pursued it because a lot of my badge major classmates actually went for it. And I was one of those who were invited for um, a job application interview. And I also talked about this in my previous videos, but just to give you an idea, a telemarketer is someone who would call people or potential customers and tell them about a certain product. And when they're interested, they become a lead. And hopefully the company or whoever is assigned to convert them into clients or customers would actually convert them into clients or customers. So our job really is to just do outbound calls. We had an automatic um, outbound dialer. It would dial automatically for us and we just have to do our opening spiel, um, call these random people and offer a product or a service. So I lasted for a month because I was a working student and I had a full load of um, classes back then. Uh, but I was really proud of myself for lasting a month in that, uh, in that type of workplace where we would just be taking calls in a duplex in one of the villages in Davao City. Uh, so I, I tell you, yeah, it's, it's a bit shady, you know. And then after that, uh, when I graduated college, I was 20 years old. My first legit job was a customer service specialist in one of the BPO companies here in Cebu. And at that time, I was really excited for that job. It was not because I did not have a choice, but it was really something that I liked or I wanted to pursue. So I was not forced or anything. Unlike um, some people would say that you're working in a call center because you don't have a choice or because your college degree does not allow you to apply for a certain job or something like that. That time, it was really my choice. My main job was exclusively to take calls and I was in a financial or banking account. So for 10 months, I took calls exclusively and I think my performance was good enough to be uh, rewarded or to be recognized by my supervisors. So I was invited to become a peer coach 
And when you are a peer coach, you're still the same level with the agents. You still have the same salary, but you're considered a subject matter expert. And basically what you do is you walk the floor and help your your teammates or other people would raise their hand on the floor and ask questions. So if you're like helping the supervisor as they do their administrative tasks, and then you are the one um, helping answer the questions or uh, even helping with escalated calls sometimes. So while I was a peer coach, I was still taking calls in between. And then I think after a few months, I was invited to become a peer trainer. It was not part of my plan to be a peer trainer, but I don't know, I was um, invited by my supervisor. I was interviewed and it was accepted. So as a peer trainer, you're still pretty much like an agent, but the call time was significantly reduced. You'll be off the phone for the most part because uh, that time I was observing the lead trainers, how they handle their classes, how they teach the new hires and things like that. It was a really good opportunity for me to learn more about how um, our account or our program teaches the new hires and even runs classes. Uh, so it's something new to me, but it was very enriching. So after a few months um, of being a peer trainer, handling classes and everything like that, I was already slated to become a lead trainer. It actually took a long time for me to get promoted because at that time, um, there were still a lot of peer trainers as well. So it's not like you're fighting for that, but you know um, how it is in a corporate environment. It takes a while to get promoted. And not only that, as a peer trainer, I still had the same salary grade as that of the agents. So it took me a long time to really get a salary increase, uh, but that was okay for me because that time I thought like, this is it, I'm already climbing the ladder of success. I just wanted to pursue uh, the trainer position. So I think after about a year, which was, I know, a long way, that I became a lead trainer, finally. And then as a lead trainer, I was already handling full-time classes uh, for eight hours and even staying in the office until the wee hours of the morning to finish my admin tasks and you know just do the job. It was still something that I took as an opportunity for me to grow in the company. You can get called by your manager to run a class on a particular shift that would be opposite from the shift that you had the previous week. So I tried like all shifts in the world. So for example, this week I would be on a 7 p.m. to 4 a.m. class. And the next week I can be on a 4 a.m. 7 p.m. class. So that's like the opposite from last week's schedule. And that's just how it is. It also depends on the availability of the rooms and a lot of other factors. So I lasted seven years in that BPO company it was acquired two times. Seven years, I would say it's quite a long time to stand in a company. Uh, and then it just hit me that I need to move on to something else. I did talk about why I left my corporate job in one of my past videos. If you want to watch it, I can link it up there. And then I decided I want to become a remote worker or an online worker, whatever that means. I just jumped ahead and say, I want to start this. Okay, so after working in the BPO company, I became an Amazon content specialist. At that time in 2016, when I started working from home, I did not even know that I would be working for an Amazon seller or an Amazon company. But the seller was based in Canada and he was very, very nice. At first, I still had a very fixed schedule. But since I was working from home and I was able to prove myself to him, he allowed me to have a flexible schedule so that I could work about four hours Canadian time, which means that would be graveyard. Not, not graveyard anymore, but at least at night, I can work from 9 to 12, for example, and then the next day I can work in the morning or in the afternoon. So it's quite a huge jump for me in terms of scheduling because I felt like I was slowly gaining my freedom in terms of my time. Not only that, I was working 100% remotely. I did not need to go to the office. I also did not know that it was actually possible, but it was, and I loved it. So I never looked back since then. I really just wanted to 
um, at that point, work online. And I think I was successful in a sense because I never went back to the office. Not that working in an office is bad or anything. You do you, whatever you like. But for me, I really was able to change my life by working remotely. So for that job, I was like an all around Amazon virtual assistant. Although I did not call myself a virtual assistant because the, the owner or the founder did not really refer to me as a VA. It was a startup company, so he was also still just trying. I think I was one of his first hires that he outsourced in the Philippines. So what I did was I wrote blog posts, I handled social media, I did customer service. Um, it's all chat and email for this Amazon seller. There was no phone time. It was not such a huge jump because I, I still handled customer service. But I handled a lot of the marketing stuff, except the PPC or pay-per-click ads. And for five years, I was uh, doing a lot of things from writing listings to helping with design, marketing, replacements, customer support, social media, everything. And then after that, I decided to move on to a different career. Uh, I worked as a content manager for an offshore um, company. I also had several different clients in between. Um, I would also work on social media, on YouTube channel management, and podcast management. Now, this is what a lot of people probably don't know. While working in e-commerce and in content marketing, I was also trying to grow my personal brand. I was already blogging ever since college, and when I was in the BPO, I was also blogging on the side. It was just a side hustle or a side gig for me. I was not, I was not really earning money from it, but I knew that it was what I wanted to do. I really wanted to write for a living. Um, not forever, but at least have it as part of my career path. Uh, I felt that I could grow as a writer. So that's why I started blogging and it proved to be a very advantageous part of my career. So I started a blog and also I started this YouTube channel, which I did not expect to grow and really have this awesome, amazing community where you and I um, have this connection and really talk about the things that are important to us, the things that matter. So while working on this YouTube channel, I'm also working on a lot of other things on this side, which I don't really talk a lot about on social media. And also as a blogger, also as a marketer for other uh, brands and businesses. And then I'm also doing consulting on the side. So as a consultant, I work as an independent contractor, which means I'm not tied to one contract only. And I think as a consultant, this is really where I was able to bring out my expertise and really add value to brands and businesses. Okay, so I'm going to briefly compare and contrast being an employee and a freelancer. So for the main part, employee is tied to a certain company, strictly tied to a certain company and one contract. And it is specifically stated in your contract that you can only work for one employee and nobody else. So for the most part, you have a fixed schedule or shift. And also in some companies, you're not even allowed to have a side hustle or a side gig. Some companies will not even allow you to sell things <laughs> to your co-employees, which is why probably a lot of your co-employees are selling in secret. Yes. There's actually such a thing wherein you're prohibited to do that in the office. Also, as an employee, you can be working fully on site. You can also be working fully remotely or work from home or hybrid. So on site, obviously you're in the office. When you're working from home, you're employed by this company, but you are 100% just working from home or remotely or anywhere you like. Now take note that this really depends on the company you're working for because some companies would really strictly tell you to work from home only because of privacy and uh, security reasons. Some companies would say work wherever you like as long as you get the past done, which is like the dream, right? <laughs> and some companies are also hybrid. So 
example, three days a week, you'll be in the office. Two days of the week, you will be working from home or wherever you like. So it just really depends on the company. As an employee, your pain has a ceiling. So it has a limit. Most corporate companies already have this structured pay grade. So salary grade A, for example, this is uh, the amount that you can only get. And then when you move to salary grade two or B, then it's a different range of salary until you get to whatever the company's limit is. And that's because, of course, a lot of corporate companies have their stakeholders or other owners, board of directors who get to have a say on what you'll be paid. And you can't really just go there and say, I need a raise. It doesn't happen overnight. It needs to be checked, reviewed, tested, and it will take a long time for you to get the salary that you think you deserve. Even though you're already doing so much of what's expected from you or even uh, when you are exceeding expectations. The sad truth is that that's it. That's going to be your salary uh, unless you move to a different company or you become the CEO of the company, which is probably unlikely if there's already a lot of people in the lineup. So that's one of uh, the limitations of being an employee. And obviously, as an employee, you have your employer benefits. So that's one of the advantages. Your employer is mandated to pay your government benefits, um, everything else. Like in the BPO, you have the hazard pay, night differential, uh, HMO, 13 month pay, and all that jazz. And you are also not going to worry about paying your taxes anymore because those are automatically taken out from your pay. Like it or not, that's how it is when you are an employee of a company. On the other hand, when you're a freelancer, you are considered a self-employed professional or an independent contractor. So regardless of the term that your client or your manager or your boss will be using, in taxation terms, at least here in the Philippines, a freelancer is considered a self-employed professional. And in most of my contracts, I am considered or called an independent contractor. So that means that you are not an employee of a company. Therefore, you are allowed to work with other clients as long as, and this should be checked, it should be specifically stated in your contract that you are free to work with other clients as long as it's not going to be a conflict of interest. And what does that mean? That business that you're working with, aside from the current one you have, are not competing businesses. So yeah, basically that's the lowdown of everything. Aside from that, okay, as a freelancer and independent contractor, your schedule is mostly flexible. But then again, this is also depending on the client. Since working in 2016, I was able to negotiate my schedule and I was able to work on a very flexible schedule in such a way that I'm able to take care of my family, um, travel whenever I want without worrying about being in the office. As a freelancer or an independent contractor, it is possible that you only work with one client for the long term. But it's also possible that you can be working with two clients at the same time, as long as the work that you do for one client does not overlap or affect the other and vice versa. So you really have to set aside time for client one and set aside time for client two so that your work output is still that you know, expected quality that your client is, you know, expecting from you. And the last thing about being a freelancer or independent contractor, I'm sure I can make a whole video about this, but these are just the general things. You can control how much you charge based on your experience and what you're worth or what you can bring to the table. So essentially, while being an employee has a ceiling or a limit, there is no limit to what you can earn as a freelancer or an independent contractor. It depends on how hard you work or how many clients you want to take. And at the end of the day, at least this is how I look at it. It depends on how much you're comfortable to charge and how much your client can afford to pay you.
there are other freelancers who would want to accept many different clients, but their time will not allow them anymore. And these freelancers move on to becoming agency owners. So what they do is they outsource or they they hire other people to work for them. And essentially that freelancer is acting as an agency owner, hiring different people who would work for the different clients that the freelancer has. At this point in my life, and I've thought about it several times, it is not what I want to follow. That's not the path that I want to follow at this point. Did I just repeat that? <laughs> yeah, because I want to highlight that I really just want to be a freelancer working with one to two clients at a time. And as long as I reach my income goal, then I'm good. I don't need to be an agency owner. But maybe if you reach that point in your life, then why not? If that's really what you want, right? Now we're down to the last part of this video, which is how I make my dough. So my earnings comparison from when I started up until now, well, obviously I'm going to give you a range of amount because my earnings are not the same every month. Sometimes I have months where I don't earn as much. There are months where I earn so much that I could afford not to work for a month. So it really depends. Uh, and that's just one of the perks. I would say perk, but I'm not sure if you consider that a perk. <laughs> some people would not consider that a perk because some people want to have the stability of becoming an employee wherein you would receive your monthly salary on a certain schedule but when i started working as a freelancer in 2016 i have already acknowledged the fact that there's no stability even as an employee and that's just me okay that's my personal opinion anytime you can get fired so you have to be prepared and i know that doesn't sound good but it happens and it already happened before to people i know thankfully i did not experience getting fired just yet but i know that it is possible to get fired so anyway let's continue and so i started as a telemarketer right i earned 500 pesos per week i lasted a month that was a really small amount for something that i had to go to work to at night there were no incentives and all that it's just 500 pesos per week i was able to pay my rent which was 500 pesos a month that time so yeah at least helped me a little bit and i also like saw how the operations work in a call center even though it's a shady call center still it was not worth it for the type of work that i did and i still had to travel at night as a student i still had to wake up early uh, so I stopped after a month and it was just a learning experience for me. Next is a customer service agent salary when I worked in the BBO. My starting basic salary was 12,000 pesos. That was the offer. But since I was profiled for a financial company, our client, which was one of the biggest banks in the United States, offered to provide a 4,000 pesos client or account program allowance which brought my salary to 16,000 pesos every month. That was a big amount that time for someone like me who was back then still single and just recently graduated. It was already really good for me and it was back in 2009. Right now in call centers in the Philippines, I believe there are still companies offering 13,000 pesos to 16,000 pesos as a basic pay, especially for beginners and for people who have experience, it can be 18,000 pesos up to 25,000 pesos. And it also depends on the type of work that you do. It also depends on the company that will hire you. So along with a 16,000 pesos basic salary, I also had incentives for every metric that I would hit. And then after a couple of years, it was changed to like an ABC performance rating. So if you get an A on your scorecard, you get an additional incentive. And we had the usual hazard pay night differential. Uh, at one point, I was able to earn as much as 20,000 pesos in addition to my basic pay uh, because I hit all my metrics. So it really just depends on how good you are as a customer service agent working on site. And then when I transitioned to becoming a lead trainer, 
I was offered 20,000 pesos basic pay. And then there are incentives and allowances on top of the 20,000 pesos basic. So it would add up to up to 25,000 pesos in a month. But if you deduct the taxes and the government benefits, then your take-home pay is not really as much. Before I left the BPO company, my salary every month was, I think, up to about 25,000, 26,000 pesos in a month, which was not really huge. <laughs> so I moved to a different career. I became a content social media um, specialist for an Amazon brand. I was offered 25,000 pesos as my basic pay. So I was really happy because, hey, I could just stay home, not take calls, not commute, and still earn 25,000 pesos. And I get to do what I wanted to do. I get to write for a living, be on social media. Although at this point, I really feel like 25K is a bit small. But that time, it was huge for me who was still starting as an online freelancer. And on top of that, I had the freedom to work with other Amazon sellers as well. So I could still have the opportunity to increase my earnings. So as an Amazon content specialist, I told you earlier that I did a lot of things. So from 25,000 pesos in a month, I was able to gradually increase it to up to 30 to 35,000 pesos in a month. Uh, and it was okay with me because again, I can work with other clients i can earn more but at that time i really just chose to work with one amazon seller because i was also starting to earn a good amount of income from my youtube channel and in a month i would earn now i'm going to switch to dollars because youtube pays in dollars at the lower limit 300 dollars and the upper limit i would get thousand dollars in a month so if you convert that to pesos right now it can be like twenty five thousand pesos in a month at the lower limit uh, and 50 to fifty five thousand pesos in a month not bad for doing videos and for helping educate people like you by the way this is the youtube adsense only which is what i earned from the ads that i'm getting from my videos and it took about a month or two for me to get monetized in this channel. And ever since I got monetized, I was already able to cash out. That was a huge help for me because then I did not need to really work with a lot of clients to achieve my income goal. Because honestly, I did not have the fantasy of becoming a multi-millionaire or multi-billionaire. I want my peace, I want my work-life balance, and not spend every waking hour of my life thinking about work. I did not want to sacrifice my life for work. So that's why I did not work with many different clients just to earn more than what I actually need for myself and for my family. So I was okay with it. Um, and until now, that's still pretty much the same thing that I'm getting from my YouTube AdSense. And we also have sponsorships and brand deals. In the Philippines, they, they pay about 5,000 pesos to 15,000 pesos. And on the higher end for like bigger companies, they pay about $500 to $675 to $700 per sponsorship project. So it can be a video like this, or it can be like a trading project. It really depends on the company. The bulk of my income is coming from freelance consulting. So essentially, I create different types of content, mainly videos for different types of clients to help them increase their brand awareness and also help them manage their social media accounts. Uh, this is all for growth and marketing. So it can be something that I do on my channel or on my social media profiles, on my blog. It can also be something that I do internally for a company. You will be able to achieve this level if you have a certain specialization and you're able to produce output or good results for your client. And this really means experience. You will not be able to charge what you want if you did not have previous results that you can show to your clients and you did not have anything to say that 
um, I was able to do this for my previous client, so I can do this for you now. So at this point, um, the income ranges from the lower limit of about $1,000 to the higher limit of $4,500. And again, there's no limit. I'm just saying higher and I'm just saying lower and higher limit for my own um, standard because again, I don't really like kill myself to work for a lot of different clients. I just take it easy and make sure that I achieve my income goal. So yeah. And we have notable minorities. <laughs> we have digital products, which I sell from time to time, around 3,000 pesos to 7,000 pesos a month without aggressive marketing, meaning I don't really do a lot of Facebook ads or things like that. It's just like organic marketing for the most part. We also have affiliate marketing, wherein you um, sell other people's products. So that can be in the Philippines around 500 to 1,000. <laughs> because I, I don't really put so much effort on it. And then for foreign companies, I get about 300 to $500 a month. So that amounts to about 25K to 30K a month as well. And we also have, although a very small amount of my income, we have the blogging sponsors and projects. I still cannot give up blogging because I love writing about any, anything in my life and my experiences. Um, it starts at $100 around, how many Shanae dollars now? Around five to 6,000 pesos or 7,000 when the exchange rate is high. So yeah, that's pretty much how I make the dough. And then again, it differs from month to month. So yeah, six digits a month is a pretty good income, I would say so myself. Okay, now the million dollar question is how do you go down this route if you like? And by that, I mean, how do you go from being a call center agent to becoming a freelancer, working with clients that you love and being able to charge what you think you're worth uh, based on the value that you provide for the value that you can provide to your clients. In my next video, we will talk about how he can start your freelancing journey. These are beginner steps, obviously. So if you're an advanced freelancer, then this is not for you. So I'll see you on my next video. If you have any questions about this topic, make sure to comment below and I'll make sure to respond. Don't forget to subscribe and share this video. Take care and bye.